Hi everyone, I'm Rose Martin and we are right around the corner at Smith Mountain Lake with a masterful storyteller, international bestseller, and literacy advocate David Baldacci. That's right, with over 100 million books in print, 40 languages, and 80 countries, David believes that a book can change your life, and I agree. Hi David, welcome to Right Around the Corner. Thank you. And tell me, how does a book change someone's life? Well, it changed my life in that I was a writer. I'm a writer today because I was a reader as a kid, a voracious reader. I would go to the library every week, check out more books than I was supposed to because the librarians knew me. And yeah, they, they had limits. I, they, yeah, and they, but they knew I would read them all, and I'd come back for more the next week. And when you, jump, when you open a book, you jump into someone's imagination, and that's what I love doing when I open a book of, of a writer. And I wanted to have that same effect over the people. I wanted to have someone jump into my imagination, and today I'm a writer because I was a reader as a kid. Who were some of those favorite authors as a child? You know, I can still remember the first Sherlock Holmes story I read. Really? It was a speckled band. And when I, it was a Reader's Digest condensed book. And I opened it up and it was a picture on the front cover. And then I delved into this story about this serpent and this doctor from Stoke Moran and Watson and Holmes. And I was enthralled. I mean, I really was. And I think that was the first mystery I'd ever read. But I was, I, re, I read lots of different things. I loved, I loved histories that were written, biographies of famous people, but it was about their childhood. Mm -hmm. It was a whole, you know, uh, set of those books. I loved going to the library and reading those, and everybody from Benjamin Franklin to the Ringling Brothers. And it only, and the book would stop when they turned 18, and you, and you yeah. knew what happened. But I, it showed me that as a kid, you know, you could do anything with your life. Well, and your writing career started age eight with a journal from your mom. Yeah, she gave me a journal. I was one of those kids that never shut up. So mm -hmm. I was always telling these tall tales and yarns and... One day my mom brought me a book and said, honey, why don't you try writing some of this stuff down? And as soon as my pen hit the paper, it was like this epiphany. I was like, oh my God, you know, I can translate what's up here and here. Other people can read it. And I never, really never looked back. I just started writing short stories. I wrote screenplays and teleplays and novellas and novels. And I went back to my mom years later and I said, you know, what a gift you gave me. Thank you so much. And my mom was like, I'm so glad it's worked out for you, honey. But quite frankly... I just wanted to shut you up. No. <laughs> you know, you're on my last nerve. You never right. stop talking. And even, I love you. Mother, mothers always love their kids. But, uh, you know, even moms need a little peace and quiet. Oh, how funny. How funny. And she was quite a tough lady, right? Because you don't have any damsels in distress in your book. You've no. got strong women around you. Yeah, she was a force of nature, my mother was. And uh, I married a force of nature. We raised a very independent daughter. Uh, it's it's a very simple rule why I don't write about damsels in distress. In my whole life, and I'm into my 50s now, I have never met one in my life. I love that. So, you know, that's why I don't write about them. And as a wrestler and a football player, I read a story that you would arm wrestle your mom? Yeah, until I was like 16. And I was a really, I was a captain of my wrestling team and I played football until I was like 16. I really couldn't beat my mom. She was mountain strong. You know, mm -hmm. she was the youngest of 10, grew up in the middle of nowhere on a mountain in southwest Virginia. A place called Ramsey's Ridge in Dickinson County. It's the poorest county in, in Virginia. And um, in 2004, the Washington Post, I sent my mom this article. She was still alive. In 2004, uh, they finally pulled running water and electricity up to Ramsey's Ridge. Wow. My mother grew up in the 1930s. That's how remote it was. What about stories? Was she also a storyteller? Both my mother and my grandmother. My grandmother lived with us for the last 10 years of her life. And she was a school teacher. And uh, I would go into her bedroom every morning before I went to school, and we would talk. And, and you know, Virginia back then, what do you talk about? Oh, the, you know, the Civil War. She called it the War of Northern Aggression, of course. And we would argue and back and forth about it because, you know, I was just a little kid, but I love Virginia history. And as I tell people in Virginia, you can't turn around and throw a rock without hitting a national monument. That's right. just the way the state <laughs> is built. Um, but when my grandmother passed away, she left, the only thing she really she had left was one item, and she left it to me, her grandson. And it was a U.S. 1861 U.S. Springfield single shot rifle that her great, great, great uncle Paul Rose had carried with them in the Civil War. It's even got the, the strap oh, wow. to carry it over the shoulder. It's still got, you know, blood smudge on it. And as my grandmother told me, the only problem was that he fought for the Union. Oh. And of course, I pointed out to my grandmother, well, didn't they win? Right. Well, <laughs> so we had some good arguments back and forth. But she would tell stories, my mom too, of growing up in the mountains. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom would, you know, it, in the middle, in, you know, it, it, after dark, they would send her off to the little coal mine they had on the property. When she was seven years old with a bucket to get coal. Um, swinging on grapevines over chasms in the mountains and you know these were stories that I sort of listened to at her knee and um, you know it was wonderful 
and it was tough growing up in that area with the coal mines. I mean, it was a it was a tough life for all of them, with it, it, ten it, kids and their families. Yeah, it was kind of boom or bust. And uh, if people look at the copyright page in all my novels, there's the Columbus Rose Ltd. That holds all the copyrights, and that's my company. Uh, my grandfather was Columbus Rose. Mm. That was my mother's father. So. Uh, I thought it was the coolest name. Well, I love the story about your daughter when she was in kindergarten and you're heading off to be guest speaker. Yes, it was, you know, parents career week, you know, job week. And so you're supposed to go in and talk to, you know, 25, five-year-olds about, you know, what you do for a living. And my daughter put a lot of pressure on me because she had come home like the week before and said, you know, Jimmy's mom came in and she's a, she's, she was a policewoman and this other guy's dad is a firefighter and this other guy owns a gas station and then she looks at me and she goes dad what are you what are you going to do she goes you know you can't write in the books okay you don't put your names in the books that's what she used to think i did for a living yeah. i would sign my name in books and people would pay me for that so i, I went there I, br I brought on a movie poster from absolute power i had some books and i sat down and you know in the floor with them and i just talk, started talking to them and um, this and this and storytelling and imagination and all that. And we had a great time for about five minutes. And, <laughs> and I, that's I, it, five-year-olds, right? I had 25 <laughs> more minutes to go, you know. So then I started telling them about, um, I was out on the movie set when they were filming the first Batman. I said, anybody, everybody like Batman? Oh, yeah. Like, I sat in the Batmobile. I'm like, oh, my God, you sat in the Batmobile. And they got their attention for like, you know, three or four minutes. And I'm just trying to, you know, scramble around. And I said, okay. Um, I brought some foreign editions of my books. I was going to hold the books up, and people were, you know, let the kids guess what the languages were. And I figured this is going to take 25 yeah, minutes. Yeah, I'm down so. to 21 minutes. I've got this. I got this. So I held the first book up. A little boy said Spanish. I said, okay, that's right. Held another one up. German. I was like, okay. Mm. I, I put it down and I held it up. Mandarin Chinese. I was like, oh, okay. boy. This is a Washington, D.C. suburb school. Uh -huh. Lots. Of, I put it down, and I picked up my ace in the hole. I picked it up, held it up. A little boy in the back goes, that's Latvian. I was like, that's what that one is. <laughs> Thanks for telling me, little yeah. boy. His grandparents were from Latvia. So I was really, I didn't know what else to do. And then I, I committed the cardinal sin. I, I said, anybody have any questions? And a little girl raised her hand and she goes, and I said, oh, do you have a question? Yeah. She didn't have a question. She proceeded to tell this really embarrassing story about her mother. You know, highly embarrassing story about her mother, and everybody's giggling and laughing. And the, I look over the kindergarten teacher, and she's like, "Mm-hmm, yeah, you know." Welcome you, to my world. That's right. You know, you, you broke it. You own it. Um, so I look back at the little girl, and she's smiling at me. She's so proud of the story, and I had to tell my daughter to sit down because it was my daughter, <laughs> oh. and the embarrassing story was about her mother. Oh. And, uh, so it was. I got out of there with like a few minutes to spare. Oh, how funny. How funny. So the, when you met your wife, you met at a vegetarian restaurant and... Yeah, it was a vegetarian barbecue thrown by some mutual friends of ours. And uh, neither one of us are vegetarian, by the way. It was just, that's what they were doing. And and I was a trial lawyer back then. You know, I was in my um, 20s and I was like so full of myself. It was unbelievable. And um, so I'm telling people some of the cases I was handling, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I had this tap on my shoulder and I turn around and there's Michelle and... and uh, and I said, oh, hey, how are you? And, and she goes, oh, fine. She goes, I, I'm listening. I'm hearing you're telling people that you're, you're a lawyer. And I said, yeah. I said, yeah. I said, you want to you know, hear some about some of my cases? She goes, no. Can I give you a piece of advice? And I said, okay. She goes, I wouldn't go around telling people that. And then she just left. I was like, she just totally dissed me. Yeah. She I've, called me out. I know. I've got to date her. Yeah. <laughs> so I called her up and we went out and, you know. Oh, that's wonderful. And you give her so much credit for being... The rock and the critic and just that life oh, partner who absolutely. just is behind you. I have a, I love this story about her. We, uh, we have a place in Florida and we wanted to buy a car to keep down there, right? So I ordered this car and I wasn't in Florida when it came, but she was. So I was off doing something else. So she went to the dealership, signed all the papers and stuff. And the guy, the salesman was there, a big fan, right? So she signed the pet and he's going on and on about how great I am, blah, blah, blah. Everything she's heard a million times, mm -hmm. right? And she's just methodically just signing stuff. And finally the guy stops talking about me. And then he says to her, he says, so, you know, what do you, what do, you do? <laughs> and so my, Michelle just keeps signing all the documents, signing. And finally when she's done, she put the pen down. She looked up the guy and she goes, what do I do? And he says, yeah, what do you do? And she said, 
everything else. Yeah, boom. <laughs> <laughs> boom. Yeah, I'm doing everything else while he's out gallivanting. So the credit right here goes right here. Oh, that's funny. No, we're very much a team. Yeah. And it needs to be that way. It has to I be. think another one of the funny stories that um, that just I found myself laughing out loud was when you were in the restaurant and you were mistaken for a yes. friend of yours, yes. and you know you're getting the snake eye, and you're like, yes. "Oh boy, babe, here we go." <laughs> yeah, yeah. The woman, came, uh, she was like laser locked on me in this restaurant. Michelle and I were in a booth having lunch, and and I looked over, and this woman's like staring at me, and finally, I, it happened like three times. And finally, I stopped looking, and then she came over, and you know she's pushed me over in the booth and sat down next and to like me. And like moved you over. She did. And she, you know, she wanted to know, um, you know, she, she said, I know, you know, I, you are who I think you are. And I said, well, I, again, I didn't know she was a psychopath. I had yeah. no idea who she was. We're having lunch and I'm getting the stare down. Right. And I said, well, do you read a lot of fiction? And she said, oh yeah, I read a lot of fiction. I said, well, I probably am who you think I am. And then she turned and screams across her restaurant to her husband. You know, she was so proud of herself. She goes, I was right, Joe. I was right. It is John Grisham. <laughs> So, you know, I've known John a long time, and uh, he's a great guy. Um, really wasn't feeling the love for John at that point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and Michelle, I swear to God, it was just, it was so funny. Michelle blew iced tea out of her nose. Just blew it <laughs> right, right across, across the, the table. table. <laughs> yeah, and she, and she told the woman, you know, it's, you got the right genre, but got the wrong author. And the woman looked at me again. She goes, oh, my God, are you Baldacci? And I said, yeah, I am. And then she screams across the restaurant to her husband again. You were right, Joe. It is, it's the Italian. You know, so I was like, how did my head, how did I get my head get outside of the door that day? Oh, right. It was so big. Michelle thought it was the funniest yeah. thing she had ever heard. Well, I also love the story about when I'm growing up Catholic, I, when I heard that you had to go early, hour and a half early to save the rope, yeah, yeah. I've been there. Yeah. You know, I've been there where my mom and dad or the family said, you know, we're running a little late. We need you to go, yeah. you know, early and save the row. And as people are coming in, they're like, is this taking safe? Yes. Saved, get it. But, you know, I've never had a book idea in the hour and a half early in church. What was that? Oh, that that was amazing. Yeah, it was, it was son's confirmation, which is a big deal. And so we, um, I went an hour and a half early. It, it was, it had been a hard year for me because my, my dad had passed away and my mom was do doing well. My son, this, you know, confirmation is sort of the last big deal before you get married and then the last rites. And it's a big gap, hopefully, right? And I was kind of thinking about, you know, life moving on, you know, even my own mortality. And so this idea for, you know, this guy who was terminally ill and everybody's getting ready to say goodbye and he's leaving behind a wife and three kids and um, and his, his last job is to say goodbye and make sure that his family's going to be okay and his wife's issue is, you know, I have to keep living, you know, without him. Um, but then in, in my mind, uh, you know, the story comes down to he ended up being the surviving parent. And the whole story unspooled in my head while I was sitting in the church you mm. know, for over an hour and a half, which is rare. You know, I don't usually know the ending of the stories before I sit down to write them, but this one kind of just hit me all at once. And I went home and I started writing and I wrote it very fast, like two months it was done. Mm. And nobody knew I was writing it. It was just a whim on my part. And I sent it up to my publisher and they were like, oh my God, wh where did this come from? And I told them about, you know, going to church early. And so my editor, you know, I think sort of partly tongue in cheek, he said, can I ask you a favor? And I said, sure. He goes, can you go to Mass a lot more often? <laughs> Early, like two hours. <laughs> Maybe we can get two books out of that. <laughs> right. Well, and that's what I love also about your process, that you don't know the ending, which keeps us guessing too. Yeah. I think that uh, as that all evolves, that turns into really interesting characters and a twist and turns to where sometimes I think I've got it figured out. I'm like, nope. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't get it. Wasn't there. Yeah. So when you're in the zone, you know, I'm thinking... Mm, if you can do these bursts of writing for 10 or 15 hours and what it must be like to live in your head. You know, those, those bursts are awesome and I live for them too because in between those bursts are often a lot of just walking around, daydreaming, trying to figure things out. Um, and a lot, as I call it, sweat equity. But when you're sitting down and the words are flowing and I don't, I don't get up, I don't get up, you know, after 2,000 words or five pages, I just roll, I roll until my tank is empty. And then, you know, I come back the next day and try to do the same thing. I like to let the book grow organically. I've, I've always felt like if I wrote from an outline, it would read to all of you like I wrote it from an outline. Mm -hmm. Things are too neatly tied together and they too make too much logical sense. And it's almost like if you're a reader, you jump to the end and read the last few pages to make sure everything's okay. And then you go back. Well, it's never going to be the same because if you know the ending when you're writing it, it's like, okay, well, you know what? I'm not writing a book. I'm typing to the end. 
at this point. I'm looking at my outline. What does it say I'm supposed to do today? Oh, right, that's right. So you're filling in the spaces, yeah. yeah. I can't write that way. <laughs> so I like to be spontaneous and sit down and literally not knowing what I'm going to write until I sit down and I look at the screen and my fingers are poised over the key and then it clicks and I go. And, and before, if you get writer's block? Well, it, it's a, writer's block is just a process of writing. You know, everybody does. So then you, I go, you go off and do something else. Mm -hmm. You know, one of my surefire anecdotes for, for that is I got to take a shower. I can't tell you how many plot issues I've overcome through taking a shower. And, and I'm also incredibly clean all the time, too. Yeah, you know, that's, that's right. Nice, <laughs> it's a nice attribute. Yeah. And Michelle's like, hey, are you coming out? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Give me another hour, honey. Right. <laughs> Well, I think it's fun that when you talked about earlier that they didn't know you were writing the story about when you're right before Absolute Power came out and you're with that really kind of cranky senior partner oh, with the yeah. oral and <clears throat> yeah, tell that story. Yeah, you know, it was, I had just joined this firm. I, most of my career, I was at a boutique firm of about 10 lawyers. I liked that a lot. And then uh, for a lot of different reasons, we decided to be two of the lawyers, uh, myself and my partner, uh, joined this huge firm, this massive firm, like hundreds of lawyers. And I was assigned um, to work with a senior partner who was, um, you know, let's just say he was um, paid great attention to detail, you know, and was very particular about his ways. And so I was assigned to work on this deal with him. And it wasn't, it wasn't litigation, it was an acquisition. We were, you know, acquiring another company, a client was anyway. And so I, um, he had asked me to call up the other side, the other side he was representing this, the, uh, the seller, and confirm that some facts were true or not, you know, just for the part of the negotiation. So I called the lawyer up and asked him questions, and he told me, and I wrote it all up in a memo and sent it to the senior partner, and as soon as he got it, he called me into his big corner office. I went down there, and he had the memo, and he said, read this memo to me. And I said, I said, okay, well, I called up attorney so-and-so, and I received... Um, you know, verbal confirmation that these three facts were true. And that was it. Pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward. And he said, okay, you received verbal confirmation? I said, yeah, I talked to him on the phone. He goes, okay. Do you know the difference between oral and verbal? <laughs> I remember just looking at him like, what? <laughs> I said, uh, well, you know, never in my whole life have I had a reason to think about that. But I guess if I thought about it, um, Oral would be like spoken word, technically, language. Whereas verbal is more encompassing. It could mean spoken language. It could be sounds. I even used an example like the grunt of a monkey. So he said, exactly. You didn't receive a verbal uh, representation. You received an oral representation. I don't tolerate imprecision in my attorneys. Don't ever let that happen again. So... I was like, okay, well, wow, this, this, is, this is weird. Um, but everybody has days like that, you know, it's okay. And I thought that was the end of it, but it wasn't the end of it. I went back to my office, and later that day in the inner office mail, I got two items from this guy. One was a page he had taken from a book. God knows where he found the book. And he had blown it up like into like a poster size. And it was how to tell the difference between oral and verbal. And there were like 10 helpful bullet points for idiots like me who didn't know the difference. And then, the, and then he sent a book, and the book was how to write well. So like a, like a week later, Absolute Power sold. And um, sold for, at that time was the most money ever paid for a first novel in, in American publishing history. It was a surreal moment beyond any expectations I had. And nobody at this firm knew I was writing. You know, nobody I'd ever worked with knew I was writing. My only people who knew I was writing all those years were my mom and dad, my brother and sister, and my wife. Not our close friends, relatives, not even my in-laws knew. So. Um, when all that happened, we had to go quickly and tell them because it was going to be in the newspapers. And my, I remember calling my father-in-law. He had lived in Iowa at the time. And I said, hey, Dad, you know, uh, he's a big, big guy, ex-Navy. And I said, the whole time I've been married to your daughter, I've been li living the secret double life. <laughs> I thought he was going to have a heart attack. <laughs> You're setting him up. Yeah. But it, so anyway, getting back to the senior partner. So I went up to New York. They threw him a big party. Time Warner had bought the book. And, you know, it was um, everywhere. It was in the Wall Street Journal. Everybody at the law firm knew about it. And they were, they were like, who's, you know, who's attorney 587? <laughs> what did he do? They didn't even know my name. And so I went back uh, to D.C. after all this had come out. And that, that book was on my desk, How to Write Well. <laughs> so I, I said, you're never going to have a chance like this in your whole life. So I grabbed the book. I went down to the, his office. I went in. He was behind his desk. I could see, you know, he was, he had, heard about the news and probably wasn't thrilled, but, um, but with as much sincerity as I could muster, I held that book up and I said, 
you're never going to believe how much this book has changed my life. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like I'd written Absolute Power yeah, in a week. Right. Since, but he just would, since you gave me this book. But he would come to book sign. I go down there every year and do books. I go to this conference room at the law firm and it's packed with books. And I sign for them and their clients and I get to see people I haven't seen in a long time, right? And he, before he retired, um, he would come in and he would bring people in and, you know, he'd be like, yeah, you know, David is kind of, I'm kind of responsible for his success. Oh. <laughs> and I let, I, let him, I let him have that, yeah. you know, it's okay. But it was weird. I love one of the things you said about a book is a way for a reader to be afraid from a distance or be scared from a distance. Oh, absolutely. And with your characters, you know, they're relatable and they're real and yet they're flawed yeah. like so many of us. Yeah. I, can't, I don't write about white knights. I don't know any. Um, I think what's interesting about people are people who fall down and then you, we write about how they get up and how they move forward. Some do it better than others. Um, sometimes you do it really well one time and you, and you don't do it really well the next time. People are always falling down and they're always failing, but that's part of life. You know, I tell people, you know, young writers coming up, you know, they worry about rejection and all that. I said, I'm, I've been rejected. I'm still rejected these days. You know, that TV or film project and, you know, uh, studio or network goes, eh, you know, not seeing it. It happens though, mm -hmm. particularly in the creative process, which is so subjective. You know, you could have the greatest story in the world. If, it, if you actually show it to the wrong person, mm -hmm. then they're not going to like it, you know, and that's not a reflection on you. That's a reflection on timing and life. Well, and you have a way of keeping track in your head with all of your books and all of the characters and all of the subplots that you can go back in there somehow and reach back and be like, oh sure, I remember what this one was doing or that one was doing. So I don't know, is there a little Amos Decker right there with David Baldacci with that recall? Yeah, there, there probably is. I, um, I had somebody who commented, I was on C-SPAN last week and did this three hour show live on C-SPAN and they had people calling in from all over the country. And one guy called in and he goes, yeah, I just read in one of your books. I can't remember the title. It had to do with Babbage Town. I was like, oh, Simple Genius. You know, it was a third King of Maxwell story that set down New Newport News. He goes, yeah, that's right. <laughs> he goes, but that book was like 11 years ago. And I said, yeah, I know, but I created it. So I remember. I've got it. The book. <laughs> but a friend of mine did call up later after the show and said, you know, and his, his, just as you said, you know, he said, you're the real memory man. Because every, all the questions people ask you about books you wrote 20 years ago, and you're able to pull all these facts and details out about it. But I've always had a good memory, and as a lawyer, you have to have a good memory. And maybe I worked on it more than most, but things that I care about, you know, I remember in great detail. Before we get to The Fallen, is there a strong female character that's about to make? Yes, a debut. Yeah, a debut? Yeah, it's, it's in November, um, Atlee Pine. And she's an FBI agent, and she works not in D.C. or place. She works in the hinterlands of the American West in the middle of nowhere. And that's where she likes being, where she's like the only federal agent in front of hundreds of square miles. You yeah, know, I was going to suggest like Rose or Rosie or Rosalie, but at least good. I mean, I don't know. I was just thinking that might have been a good idea. Rose was a close second. Oh, hey, know. thanks. I'm, I'm, and I'm glad to know that. <laughs> so when we think, talk about The Fallen, and um, in this series, Amos has an amazing um, memory, yes. but yet they end up in Barronville and all of a sudden things are not what they seem. It, he's not on vacation anymore. Yeah, they, they go to Barronville, which is a Rust Belt town in western Pennsylvania, um, you know, probably a couple hours from Pittsburgh. Um, it's a place that used to be coal mining and textiles. It's all gone now. And people came there. John Barron founded the town 120 years ago. And he, it's only, it only was created because there was a way for him to make money. A lot of places like that around this country. So people came. You know, there were jobs, so they built homes, they had families, they put down roots, and the coal went away, textiles went away, and they're like, oh my God, you know, mm -hmm. we got a house, we got kids, and we got no way to make a living. And so people just eke out an existence. So it's bad shape. The town's in bad shape. There's a huge opioid crisis, which is affecting Rust Belt towns. They call them drugs of despair. So all that's in there, but Amos goes to this place and he's staying with Alex Jamison's sister at her house. He's on the back deck and um, there's a house backing up to theirs and he sees a spark of light in this window. It's kind of a weird, it's not a light coming on, it's like this spark, almost like a condition of some type. So he goes and checks it out and he sees a body hanging from the ceiling. Uh, there's an electrical flyer in there. And um, there's another body in the, in the house as well that he finds. But he's been a detective for 20 years. He knows what he's doing as far as an investigation. The, coolest, the cool thing about this opening chapter is that the two bodies in the house, how they, are, uh, how they are in the condition they're in, it's forensically impossible for that to have occurred. 
Mm -hmm. um, so that really gets its interest. And then he starts to investigate and finds out that Barronville is not the town he thought it was. And it unfolds from there. And I love the changes with the chapters being smaller yeah. and these little cliffhangers at the end. Would you be willing to read a little bit for us? Sure, I'd be glad to, yes. This is and it. set up the section. Okay, well this is the first chapter that I was talking about. And this is after he um, has seen the spark of light. So this is Amos Decker. He reached the house's pressure treated deck and raced up the steps. He didn't look back at Amber's house, so he didn't see Alex Jameson come out and gaze quickly around for him. He got to the window where he'd seen the reflection of light. He could now smell it, which confirmed his suspicions. Electrical wiring had gotten mixed with liquid. He had investigated homicides involving arson, and the smell was unmistakable. There was a fire in there. He put his face to the glass and peered inside. Electrical fires tended to move fast, usually behind walls where they could spread unseen until it was too late. A moment later, he saw something that confirmed his worst fear, a flicker of flames and the rise of smoke. Then he looked to the right as a spear of lightning lit up the whole area. Decker froze at what he was seeing in the illumination provided by the lightning strike. A moment later, he broke free from his paralysis and ran to the back door. Without hesitating, he hit it with his shoulder like he had many football blocking sheds. The flimsy door buckled under the massive impact and fell open. The storm was screaming overhead now, so Decker couldn't hear Jameson calling to him. She had rushed off the deck and was running to the rear fence when Decker had crushed the door. The rain was falling hard now, whipped by the wind into a stinging frenzy as the storm emptied millions of gallons of water over the western edge of the Keystone State. Jameson had run out of her shoes and was soaked before she was halfway to the fence. A drenched Decker burst into the kitchen and turned right. He had his Beretta out and pointed in front of him. He now wished he hadn't had all that beer. He might need his fine motor skills to be better than they presently were. He moved swiftly down the darkened hallway, bouncing off one wall. Something fell to the floor as he brushed against it. It was a picture. Decker cursed himself because he had just contaminated what was now a crime scene, an act he would have found unforgivable if someone else had done it. Yet he couldn't be helped. He didn't know what he was going on here. What he had seen might just be the tip of the iceberg. He cautiously poked first his gun and then his head around the corner. He cleared the space with two long visual passes and straightened. Decker now knew what had triggered first the spark and next the flames and the flickering lights. Exposed electrical wires had indeed been commingled with liquid, but it wasn't water, it was blood. Mm. And there's so much more to come in that. <laughs> wow, and you know, you do so much to just encourage literacy and you and Michelle wanting to eradicate illiteracy around the country, sharing your gifts and sharing your work. Thank yeah. you for what you do. Thank you for making these changes. I know we're grateful at PBS. We are all about that also. Yes. So thank you so much. I'm Rose Martin and I'll see you next time right around the corner.